what constitutes a good deal. I want to feel like I've gotten a good deal when I walk out of the conversation. If it's just about making feel a certain way, then I could use any method of persuasion, influence, or at worst manipulation to make you feel wonderful. But you may have gotten a really crappy deal out of it. It's like if you've proposed something and someone has just said yes to you, you haven't asked for enough. Welcome to the Performance Initiative Podcast. Our goal is to provide you and ourselves with the tools to be the best versions of ourselves. We are your hosts, Dr. Grant Cooper and Dr. Zenovi Mele. We just wrapped up a conversation with Mark Raffin. We discussed negotiations. Mark answered questions like, do you need to take pauses? What do they accomplish and can you exploit them? He also went into questions like, do you need to structure a sentence or a question in a particular way? And does the structure affect the response that you're bound to get? I found that really interesting. Like if you, if you want someone to do something and you say, if you do X, then you'll make hundred dollars. You'll get a much, you're much less likely to get them to do that. than if you say, if you don't do X, you're going to miss out on the hundred dollars. They're much more likely in that instance to, to, to do the, to do X. Absolutely. And there's lots of gems like that, that are peppered throughout the conversation. Uh, and there's no one better to be talking about this topic than Mark. Mark is an award-winning negotiation trainer, speaker, podcast host, well-known negotiation expert. He trains other negotiation experts. He's the founder of Negotiations Ninja. He's written books. Uh, he's just a wealth of information about negotiations, and I think there are a ton of takeaways Absolutely. for everyone from this conversation. Enjoy. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you um, so much for having me. Yeah, it's, it's, as doctors, we don't usually participate in what would be considered as traditional negotiations, if you will. I mean, we do talk to vendors sometimes, sure. um, and, and one can make an argument that our whole life is filled with negotiations, negotiations one way or another, right? Yeah. Right. And sometimes those negotiations have clear demarcations where it's like, okay, we're, we're sitting down to have a negotiation. Sure. Um, we'll talk about a price or something. And even then it's like, when does that negotiation actually begin? Right. Well, so for instance, I, I was just recently um, in the market for a car, went into a dealership, spoke to a dealer, yep. asked a couple of questions, then got to talking about the price. And, and then no, started to... Exactly. So like, when does that negotiation start? Does it start when Zenobi walks into the dealer and starts browsing? Or is it beginning when they, when he selected the car and now they're starting at, you know, to talk about prices? So I guess our, what we want, we're hoping to start with is when do you know that a negotiation has actually started? So depend, depending on who you ask about this will usually determine your answer. Um, it's our belief that negotiation starts when you start talking about what's included, terms, those kinds of things. Where a lot of people say that negotiation starts is when you first start communicating or when you first show interest in something. I think there's, I'm a bit of a stickler for terms, so there is persuasion when that happens. There is influence when that happens, but we haven't really begun negotiating yet so i am persuading or you or influencing you in a certain direction which may impact my negotiation with you uh, and influence my negotiation with you and certainly help me with my negotiation with you if i do it well but the negotiation starts in our mind once we start talking about what a deal looks like uh, so you can think of it in two different in two different steps then in a way there's the Sort of the preamble. I mean, you know, I, I was sure. thinking specifically about in the beginning of your book, um, you know, you, you give a scenario in the first yes. pages where someone, presumably, maybe they fly in and now they're going out to dinner the night before. Right. And the, you know, the protagonist, one of them that is you in the, in the book, you know, kind of primes the other one. Yes. With, with the idea, or, you know, it's great that you're so agreeable, right? Right. And, and, that... and so I'm influencing and I'm seeding the idea of collaboration and working together and them being agreeable to my ideas in a previous. So I'm, I'm, I'm influencing and, and, and using that, but we haven't really technically begun negotiating yet. 
Oh, so you're, you're, yeah. you're kind of like setting the tone, if you will, yes. in, in a way of the interaction. So then um, if we take an analogy from, say, journalism, where there is a certain degree of either scaffolding or certain parameters, you know, the who, what, why, uh, sure. when, right? Is there a particular structure that you recommend for negotiation to follow or is it kind of free flow? Yeah, I mean, there's a very rigid format that we propose to follow. And and I say rigid in the sense that it is a process to follow, not rigid in that you must say these things in this way and that will generate X. There's There's a lot of, I believe, false teaching that says, you know, say these three things and therefore you will get a certain result. Uh, that's inaccurate uh, because that is uh, more of like a script or a gambit that needs to be used for certain situations and can only be used in certain situations. So we're big proponents of frameworks and processes whereby many scripts and many gambits can fit into those frameworks and processes to allow that. But the the framework itself is fairly rigid to allow for that. So the way that we propose most people negotiate starts with first understanding what is it that you, this is going to sound super simplistic, but what is it that you actually want from the negotiation? Now, something you said there was super interesting. You said, is it is it sort of free flow? I kind of have an idea of what I'm looking for and then free flow from there. That's a huge mistake that the vast majority of people make right at the beginning of the negotiation that sort of sets them off in a direction of not really knowing whether they've achieved what they wanted to achieve or not. And You'll you'll hear this from a lot of people where they'll, you know, the first question I ask from, from, from people is, okay, what do you want to get from this deal? Whenever I'm consulting to someone or training a team and the number one most common answer I get is, well, I want to get a quote unquote good deal <laughs> to which my response is, okay, <laughs> that wonderful, congratulations, thank you. I also want you to get a good deal, but that actually yeah. doesn't mean anything. Uh, it, it it would be like saying, well, I want to get a car, right? To use mm -hmm. your example, I want to come out with a car. Okay, well, that's why you're there, right? So we're there for the purpose of getting a good deal, to which then the, the clarifying question that I need to ask is, what constitutes a good deal? Yeah, And I can't answer that question for you. Right. And only you can tell me what makes up a good deal for you. And for a lot of people, that's about as fa far as they usually think when they're planning for their. Well, I want to get a good deal, but they haven't defined what a good deal is really. And if there's no definition around what a good deal looks like, you're never going to know whether you've been successful. To which the major pushback that I get from most people on that is, well, it, I want to feel like I've gotten a good deal when I walk out of the conversation, to which my response is, that still doesn't make sense. Because if it's just about making you feel a certain way, then I could use any method of persuasion, influence, or at worst, manipulation to make you feel wonderful. But you may have gotten a really crappy deal out of it as a result, but you'll feel good about it when you leave. And so uh, this sort of is sort of the foundation of why we do what we do, because if you aren't clear in defining what it is you want at a, at a very fairly granular level, starting with aspirational goals and working your way down into what we call success drivers, which drive the achievement of the aspirational goals, then then it's it's a, almost a waste of time because you're just not going to know whether you've been successful. Something that I like that you talk about in the book too is the idea that when you think about what it is that you want and you try to you know drill down into that, try not to have it be binary, right? Like yes. you either get this or you don't get this. There, there should be 
you know, a relative range, which makes sense. For sure. Yeah, there's, there's, there should be a range of acceptable outcomes for what it is you're trying to achieve. So maybe to follow, following through on that process idea is once you have an idea of what constitutes a good deal for you. So let's just say you're in a, it's a commercial transaction. Let's say we're not negotiating a medical transaction, but a commercial transaction. You want to make money, you want to reduce risk, you want to improve communication, could be a number of different aspirational goals that you want to achieve. Then we've got to break down those aspirational goals into things that drive the achievement of those aspirational goals. It, and without doing that, you're sort of left kind of grasping at straws. The easiest way to maybe think about this in your head is you know, at the beginning of the year, most of the Western world set the aspirational goal for losing weight, right? Like, I want to lose weight at the beginning of the year. But if you don't have things that drive the successful achievement of, quote unquote, losing weight, then the likelihood of you getting there is pretty slim. It's a nice idea. It's something that we're steering the boat towards, but we've got to have oars to row the boat to be able to steer there. So, when I say, well, I want to make money on this deal, then as an aspirational goal, I would say, how are you going to make money on this deal? Well, I'm going to sell more stuff. Okay, great. What else? Well, I'm going to increase my prices. Okay, great. What else? Well, I'm going to cross-sell these additional services. Wonderful. What else? I'm going to upsell this premium product. Okay, what else? And we'll go through a list of ways that you can generate more money as a goal in the negotiation. And there could be three, five, six different levers that you can pull to do that thing. And those are the drivers that determine the achievement of that aspirational goal. Then to your point, each of those things is not binary, right? So if my goal was um, making more money and one of those success drivers was to sell more of that thing, then it's not that I achieve it or don't achieve it. There's a range that's acceptable to me, right? So I, I, at an extreme, I would like to, let's just say, sell 20 more of that thing. But I'm not going to walk away from the deal if I only sell 10 of those things. There's a range that's acceptable to me for whatever price I'm trying to achieve. So each of those success drivers now becomes things that I can negotiate within that range and then also start to trade amongst each other. And that allows flexibility of how you construct the deal to make it the best deal for you. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We're, we're going to be talking uh, soon with this professor Alter. Who he talks in one of his books about how the, this fetishization of whole numbers, yeah. you know, and how, how, you know, you can get so keyed in on it. Well, it's got to be 10, whatever the 10 is. Sure. Like, well, would nine be okay? Yeah, nine would be okay. You know, right. <laughs> I think you discussed that too in your book. And, it, and so, you know, the, the idea of having, you know, be, there's no reason, there should be a range. If you think about it logically, if you just think about what you feel sure. okay with, a lot of times that's the case. And I think people get stuck on the idea of things being binary because it's easier, right? Like it's like, oh, it's a yes or a no, or it's a go yeah. or a stop. And the reality is, is that, New, there's a nuance to negotiation and negotiation is about playing in gray area, but you can define the range of that gray area. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be something else with something else attached to it. Right. And something that we talk about in the book is being very clear on what the bottom, to your point, on what the bottom end of that range is so that you know at which point you are going to decide that you're going to not do the deal. Yeah. And that, that's a major mistake that a lot of people make is that they, they just don't know. Right. And if you don't know, then as you're going through it, you can easily keep slippery sliding down somewhere where you didn't mean to For be sure. because you just didn't have any limits on yourself. Yeah. And you, you just keep conceding and conceding and conceding. Yeah. And then you end up with a deal that you're not actually happy with and you walk away going, I should never have made that deal. But now you're stuck because maybe you're contractually obligated. Yeah. And that's brutal. Friends, we hope you're finding value in the content. If you're enjoying what you're watching, 
please consider hitting the like button, help us with our YouTube algorithm. Consider subscribing to the channel and turn on the notification button to stay up to date with everything going on in the channel. Speaking of concessions, um, how much time should you put in thinking about what you're willing or not willing to concede on your end that they might want from you? Yeah, a significant amount of time. I think a lot of people struggle with this because they, you don't want to go into a negotiation being ready to concede on things. Like the, the mentality around concessions, a lot of people struggle with, right? So when I say make sure that you know what you're willing to concede, I'm not saying that you have to concede those things. Yeah. What I'm saying is make sure that you know what you might be willing to concede. But when people hear that, they're like, oh, I have to give that away. And that, therefore, I'm now losing in that negotiation. Maybe that's a bit of a faulty way of thinking about it. You do have to know what you'd be willing to give away because fundamentally, you are going to have to make a concession at some point in time to be able to facilitate movement from the other side, right? If you ask for something from the counterparty and they move on something that they've originally proposed and that is conditional on you moving on something in return, you've got to know how much of that thing you're willing to move on in order to facilitate that transaction. Yeah. Because if, that... you, if you don't, you're just going to get into a really difficult spot. There was a point in your book, too, about knowing the things you're willing to concede and also which are easier for you to concede sure. on that might have a higher perceived value, but you know that it's not going to cost you that much. So then if you give some time to thinking of that ahead of time, then when they ask for A, if C is easier for you to give, you can see if you can substitute it in, knowing that that's going to be an easier thing on your side. Yeah, for sure. If you can meet their need with something that doesn't cost you as much, that's um, less important to you, then it becomes easier to be able to make that work. And a lot of people, when they go into negotiations, they don't prioritize the most important things. And so they end up conceding things that are really, really important to them. And a lot of those things that are really, really important to them and not really getting much value in right. return. But the reality is, is that the value that I place on something is also different than the value that you place on something. So even if I have something that's of low value to me, that may still be of high value to you. And I can maximize your perception of the value of that thing by the way that I speak about that to make you believe that it's of higher value to me. Yeah. So that now when you achieve that thing you get more excited about it and now you're like oh i i got this thing yay good for right. me and you've achieved something of that has scarcity perceived scarcity attached to it because i've placed perceived scarcity on it so when you ask me for something the first response i'm not going to give you is okay maybe we can do that the first response i'm going to give you is we might not be able to do that <laughs> right because I want to control the perceived scarcity of that thing. Like it, it's kind of like the, the easiest consumer example that I give to a lot of people is diamonds, right? Diamonds are not scarce or rare, but diamond miners and retailers have done a phenomenal job of making you believe that they are scarce and rare. And therefore, because we believe that they are scarce and rare, we part with a lot of money for these diamonds. Yes. Um, but that's perceived scarcity. It's it's not real. It's fabricated. Yeah. You can do the same thing in negotiation. It's it it's just yeah. simple sort of supply and demand. On a much more mundane level, um, I have another book. They, uh, they were talking about the importance of that perceived scarcity. Where right. they, they were there was they, they gave an example of like you're working in a donut shop and you had some leftover giveaways. You know, maybe T-shirts from the night before, and then in the morning, the one the one possibility is the the manager comes out and says, "Hey, we had these left over from last night. Take a T-shirt." Right? right. And then the other the other way of doing that is, we really value you as a customer to our new donut shop. We have these T-shirts. We'd like you to have it. And yeah, they're limited edition. Away. Right, the limited <laughs> edition. We're not. We're just doing it today, but we wanted you to know. You know, it, and it's such a. You can just imagine how much different you would feel 
receiving yeah. that t-shirt under those two different circumstances. Yeah. One of the examples that I give is, let's just say you're, you're trying to buy golf clubs, lack of a better consumer example, but you're trying to buy golf clubs. You're just getting into golf. You're not really sure whether or not golf is the thing that you want to get. So you're going to buy used clubs because you're not going to fork out you know, thousands of dollars for the best clubs. You're going to fork out a couple hundred maybe and see how you like it. So you go on to wherever you buy used goods, Craigslist or Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace or wherever, and you see that someone in your neighborhood is selling golf clubs for that price. And, you you know, it's listed at 250 bucks. They look like they might be a fit for you. You, you think you're going to go and do it. You're going to go and do this deal. So you walk up to the person's house. And um, that person says to you, yeah, they're 250 bucks, but you're a shrewd negotiator. And you say, well, I'll give you 200. And the person says, deal, takes your money, gives you the golf clubs, walks inside immediately, doesn't even say goodbye. <laughs> How good do you feel about that purchase? Probably mm -hmm. not very good. You probably yeah. got some buyer's remorse. You're probably thinking, what's wrong with these clubs? <laughs> You're probably thinking, I didn't get a good deal. I left money on the table. But let's say, for example, that same thing happened again, and you offered the 200 But instead of saying deal, that person went, mm -hmm. see, they're my son's clubs. And my son's just gone off to university, and I really miss him. And he asked me to get rid of these clubs for him to give him the money for, to help him with college textbooks. And I'm not really sure that I can do 200. And let's just say you negotiate with this person and you end up at 220 and you've right. paid more. Would you feel better about that purchase than the first way? If the answer is yes, of course yes. you would, yeah. because they've placed perceived scarcity of that thing on you. And now you're going, oh yeah, I feel better about this. Yeah. So it's it's this weird thing that happens that we just respond better to it. We feel like we've won something. We feel better as a result of it. We feel like we've achieved something. So if you can control the perceived scarcity of something, it makes things a lot more valuable. It's, it sort of begs the I'm sorry. It, it, yeah, it sort of begs the question. question. I think it's the same thing. It, it, it begs the question how much of the of a negotiation comes down to brass tacks, you know, dollars and cents versus feelings? Ooh, uh, big question. So there's, depending on the study that you read, there's a, a lot of debate about this idea. Um, the, I think the original, there are some studies that suggest can be mostly logical. There are some studies that suggest negotiation or communication is mostly emotional or persuasion is mostly emotional. Uh, the reality is you need to have a bunch of components to your negotiation. So it can't, it's not all logical. In fact, it's impossible for it to all be logical because if it were logical, the need to have a conversation about it wouldn't even be there. Right, you would just be able to make a decision based on a spreadsheet or something that was proposed to you. Yeah. But for the most part, we feel like there's a need to have a conversation about it, which means that there is an emotional component. How much of that is an emotional component largely depends on the person that you're negotiating with. If they are more logic oriented, then it's easier to have a logic based conversation. If they're less logic oriented, then it's easier generally to have an emotional part of the conversation. And a lot of that discussion stems from like it's and it's not a new idea, right? Like Aristotle came up with this idea over 2000 years ago when he wrote rhetoric. Um, he said you needed logos, pathos, ethos and kairos. Uh, logos, logic, pathos, the emotional appeal. Right, you need to appeal to someone's emotional side when you're making a persuasive argument. Um, logos, pathos, ethos is ethical credibility. So your credibility, can you carry the argument? And then uh, Kairos, the right time. So yes, you need to have all of those things in order to maximize it. The percentages of each one is completely dependent on 
who you're dealing with. And in, in to what extent, and this is something that, that we, we talked about, um, to what extent is it cultural? Because traveling around the world and going to different markets, let's say, it is almost a neglect or even, even something that's offensive if you don't was, bargain and, and sure. haggle. And, and so in, in part of it is, is that, you know, I, I also like the, the, the idea of etymology of words and pathos, for instance, pathos, you know, emotion, but pathos in medicine, we usually think about as suffering, right? Pathology right. and so on. But in essence, in Greek, one can say that this is really more about experience, right? right? And so, so that emotion and experience and that is usually the argument that I that I've heard about the market, that market exchange is that you're there and the exchange of goods is only a part of the experience, right? Correct. Yeah. And 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 we you should feel uh, cheated and the seller don't provide that experience of going yes. of tug tug of war. So and and I I, I was telling Zenobia a story of, of my, my when I was young, we were we lived in Israel for uh, half a year, and my my mom went to the old city of Jerusalem, and she there was some pottery that was you know pretty inexpensive, and this very nice uh, trader was there, and uh, you know gave a price, and my mom said, "Great, yes, I'll take that." And then yeah, yeah, yeah he, he was an Arab guy. He goes, no, 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 that's what I'm asking. Now, now you give me a price, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he would, you know, he would rather take less and have the negotiation than yeah. My mom just be like, no, no, that's a great price. I'll, you know. <laughs> yeah, Monty Python's Life of Brian. I mean, if you, if you like, he's, <laughs> yeah. running, he's running through the bazaar and he's like, okay, I want to buy this because he wants a disguise. And <laughs> then he's like, no, no, you're not doing the thing. We right. need to do the thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. There's no satisfaction, right? I mean, if, yeah. if the the advice or the guidance that I give to people is like, if you've proposed something, and someone has just said yes to you, you haven't asked for enough. Mm -hmm. because then it's then it's just they've taken the order there's there's no if if you're not losing or they're not negotiating with you on a couple of points you're probably asking too little yeah that's interesting as as we orient towards these negotiations or you know the, the, the small and the big ones yeah is there a way that that is generally better i imagine it probably depends a little but do we want to be friendly? Do we want to be aggressive? Sure. What's the, is there a general uh, demeanor that, that people should be thinking of? Um, yes. Polite and courteous, I, I think is probably the two main things that I would guide people towards doing. There's, there was a lot of guidance in um, the, the eighties around being, you know, stern, hard nosed, negotiator no bullshit kind of guy who you know doesn't beat around the bush and is very blunt about things and there is there's certainly a role for being firm and blunt and direct and it's more than generally speaking at least in b2b negotiations there's going to be more than one conversation almost guaranteed because we're dealing in the in the millions or tens of millions or hundred hundreds of millions of dollars when we're negotiating deals, so that means that if there's going to be successive conversations, I have if I choose the route of that blunt, sort of rude, hard nosed negotiator, I have to be able to sustain that mm -hmm. over the course of those conversations, and that's just going to make the conversation super acidic and it's going to make make the negotiation too heavy. Yeah. The reality is, is that my, the success of my negotiation depends largely on the quality of information and the volume of information that I can extract from you. So if I want information, and I do, making you feel uncomfortable because I'm being, you know, rude or rough in a negotiation is is not good because you're not going to feel comfortable sharing information with me if I'm a dick. Yeah. So I have to be friendlier to use maybe a, a rough term. I have to be polite. I have to be courteous with you so that you feel comfortable with me. And there has to be, there should be a good rapport so that I access more information over the course of time 
between our meetings or over the course of time of our relationship. If you default to always being the jerk, you're not going to get as much information as you would being kind, polite, and courteous. Now, notice I, I never said generous. Yeah. That's, very, that's a very important point because a lot of people confuse what I'm saying for saying, well, okay, just concede, be generous in those. No, I'm saying be polite and be courteous. Yeah, so be Doesn't professional. Mean you have to give away. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and being overly friendly, probably not that either. Is that, that's in B2B. Do you think it's the same when you're, you know, I keep going back to buying a car, but for no good reason. When you're, you know, in terms of your everyday negotiations, do you think that that holds true? Yeah, I I think so to a large extent. I think you can, for a lot of those negotiations, they're commodity-based negotiations, single transactions, the likelihood of you ever coming into contact with that person again is probably pretty low. So there's more room there, I think, to if you choose to go that route, and I'm not saying one's better or worse, but if you choose to go that route, there's more room to screw up there and be okay. Right. right. Um, there's no value necessarily to to being a to being a dick. Yeah, I mean, at least in a B two B negotiation, there's no value to being a dick because you you the likelihood of you seeing this person again is really really right, high. Yeah. Yeah. But in in like a car transaction, like I'm probably never going to see this car salesman again in my life. Right. But so, do you think you would extract more because you're being that hard nosed? person that's debatable i don't know i think in like a especially with something like a car our access to information is so high that i can just be very blunt about what i'm looking for i can still be kind and courteous and friendly but i can also just say listen i know what the landed cost of the vehicle is that i'm looking for i have it available verified by trusted third parties on the internet give me that price or I will go somewhere else. Yeah. And that, I think that's easier to a certain extent. Whereas in complex, large negotiations, there's more than just the price that I'm looking for. Yeah. Right. It's not just about the price. I have to talk about legal terms and conditions. I have to talk about commercial terms. I have to talk about dispute resolution clauses. If things go wrong, we have to talk about how we manage risk on a go forward base. There's so, it's so big yeah. that um, it, it just doesn't benefit you in any kind of way to be rude. How important are things like your, your voice, your posture, your, you know, the other ways that you carry yourself? You know, I, I know you know Chris Voss talks about the midnight DJ yeah, voice. Yeah, the late night <laughs> FM <laughs> DJ <laughs> voice that he talks about. But yeah, I, look, I, I really like Chris. I think he's a, he's a really good dude. Um, and, and I agree with him in terms of using that voice to manage conflict, right? So a lot of times you'll see someone get really frustrated and angry. And, you know, if you drop the pitch of your voice, yeah. you slow down the batter of your speech. Oh, you did that well. We're speaking to each other really normally, and it should sound really relaxing <laughs> to the to the almost to the point that's where it great, becomes yeah. annoying right, right like right, right, that's right. More. <laughs> right so that's yeah. it's it's good in terms of like slowing down the conversation especially right. if someone's getting overexcited or frustrated or angry it's a great voice to be able to use and and he's right in that your voice and your body language are all super powerful to be able to control the flow of the conversation, right? And there's four big building blocks to your voice, pitch, pace, tone, and volume. And if you can manage each of those well, you can change the way that things are said, even just by accentuating certain words, right? Um, I've, I've got a cell phone here, for example. So I could say, I didn't say this was my cell phone. Or I could say, I didn't say this was my cell phone. <laughs> Or I could say, I didn't say this was my cell phone. I did, and then I could say, well, I didn't say this was my cell phone. Right. right? And so depending yeah. on it which changes. word you accentuate mm-hmm. will change the context and the tone and really the message entirely. So your voice changes everything. It could change everything. Like, let me give you an example. Have you ever 
received a text message from someone and thought, what a jerk. Like, All he wants is lost. Yes. For sure, right? Yeah. Like, cause yeah. text on its own doesn't provide tone. He, he texts and, me all the time. It's, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And then you think, why is it in all why, caps? Why is, he, what they... <laughs> <laughs> why is he so angry? I don't know why. Um, and, and it's true, though, right? Because th there's no tone to that text. And, and if there's no tone, there's also no context, right? So that's why your voice is so powerful. And that's why we steer a lot of people away from and the guidance we give is try your best not to have text-based negotiations. Look, summarize the deal over email. Summarize the deal over text if you must. Say, here's where we are based on my assumption uh, or based on the previous conversation or whatever it is. But when you're asking for something or conceding something or having the conversation, have it at a minimum, have it over the phone, right? Like over Zoom or Teams or choose your best web conferencing platform would be preferable or in-person is always best. Uh, but it, it allows you to provide so much more richness to the conversation and it, and it makes the conversation easier to be able to communicate, which it goes back to the emotion thing that we were talking about earlier, right? I can make you feel a certain way about something or think a certain way about something if I just change where I accentuate something, where I inflect my voice, whether I drop down the pitch, whether I slow down. Like I could say to you, hey, look, um, Zahovi, the, the reason that we're having this conversation today is because of X, Y, and Z. Or I could say, Zahovi, the reason we're having this conversation today is because of X, Y, and Z. Just that pause <laughs> alone increases the dramatic appeal of what you're about to hear, mm -hmm. right? And you go, oh, oh, this sounds important. It sounds like I'm in trouble, actually. Right. <laughs> what is right. what is going on? <laughs> yeah, right? And so when people when people hear that, I had a debate with recently some, with someone on uh, online, which is obviously where all great philosophical debates happen. <laughs> And truth but is found. The <laughs> truth is found on the internet. That's yeah, absolutely. Truth is found. <laughs> Quote me on that. There's uh, and and I said, look, based on um, the person's background, where they work, their culture, um, who they've interacted with, their experiences, there's a real opportunity to tailor your conversation to be able to elicit different responses. And they said, that's nonsense. I speak to everyone the same way. This is bullshit. I don't believe it. And I was like, okay, there's a real opportunity here for you to change how you might ask someone a question just to get a different response. Because if I treat someone the same way as I treat my most hated enemy, yeah. then then obviously it's not going to work out well for me. It's a, the statement alone of like, I speak to everyone the same way is, is, is crazy because right. obviously we don't. No one does. So just recognizing that and being aware of you can shape the way that you talk to get different responses is super powerful. Like there's... There's a, even even just the structure of your sentences, not even changing the tone, but just structuring your sentences differently, elicit different responses. There is a bunch of work that um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky came up with around just structuring sentences a certain way changes how someone thinks about the risk that's inherent in the question that you've asked. And then they, if you structure it one way, they choose a more risky situation. If you structure it another way, they choose a less risky situation just based on the sentence. So you don't even have to change the tone. Um, and so when you hear stuff like that, there, it, the whole world opens up to you. Yeah. And uh, so do you generally, do you think of the calibration? I mean, you, you're talking about calibrating voice and calibrating the sentence structure even. Mm -hmm. Do you calibrate in all aspects in terms of your physical appearance when you go face to face? For sure. Yeah. I try my best to give guidance on dress according to the audience that you're meeting with. A lot of people will say to you, well, 
always dress in a suit, always, you know, come in the in the power suit or be dominant in that situation. But the situation may not call for it. Right? Like if if I'm if I'm going to negotiate with, I did a lot of work in commodities when when I was early on in my career. If I go and negotiate with someone in a mine, who is the maintenance superintendent in that mine, and I come in in a suit, <laughs> that's the worst thing you could do in that situation. They are going to immediately think you're a putz, that you have no idea what you're talking about, that you're a complete moron, that you don't know what they go through on a daily basis. And there's there's an immediate tension there, right? So we're, we've immediately got friction. But if I come in jeans and a polo and work boots, that's now a different experience, right? Yeah. Now we're going to have a more peer-level conversation. They're going to trust me more. There's going to be more rapport. But the same is true for if I go and meet an investment banker, right? If I show up to an investment banker in sweats and a hoodie and my name isn't Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> then then I'm going to look like an idiot, right. right? So dress according to the audience that you go into to have a conversation with. It, it sounds overly simplistic, but just understanding who that audience is often determines how you dress, right? Like, so um, I will show up to training, generally speaking, for most things with uh, a t-shirt with my company branding on it and a jacket for the specific purpose of if I don't really understand who the audience is, I have the jacket to dress up and I also can pull the jacket off to be able to dress down mm -hmm. in that situation. So I try and make my wardrobe uh, as adaptable as humanly possible if I don't know. Now, when it comes to body language and those kinds of things, for sure, I want to show up in the right way to be able to have maximum rapport with that person. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's uh, speaking to that uh, there was one one time when uh, a friend of ours and I were invited to a, to um, a box seats uh, for a neurosurgical group that we that we work with. We weren't sure where we were talking shop where there was just a nice nice invitation so we decided we were going to bring sport coats. Right. It was an interesting experience where people were asking us, "What are the chances that that there's a wedding at the same time as the do? <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, making making your wardrobe adaptable is is super. I, yeah. I think super important because there are going to be situations where you just don't know, right? And even if you ask, someone will say, "Ah, just come, it's fine." Right. And you're, yeah. that actually doesn't help me. <laughs> so like making your wardrobe adaptable to dress up or dress down, carrying yeah. a tie with you if you need to, always great. You know, on a slightly different wardrobe question, that's a little, a little parallel to this. And, you know, it's and unfortunately I have to invoke uh, the Cosby show. I say unfortunately because, you know, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, but there was an episode that I always remember where Bill, where Bill Cosby is, uh, or Huxley, but I forget. Anyway. He's going to buy a, car, a, a used car and he's a doctor in the show and he purposefully dresses down and wears an For old sure. sweater so that he appears with less means. Yeah. Are there kinds of, does that, does that, is there any, is there a role for that? Probably not in B2B, but in more going through life? Um, that's a really good question. I think that there is, it depends on how good the person is sitting across the table from you because I think in a, if you meet a good car salesperson, they're going to look for every opportunity to sell you something according to how they perceive you. So it's not going to reduce the probability that they're not going to sell you something. But I think in there is, and maybe I can answer your question in a different way and tell me if I'm not answering your question. There is a role to play in terms of being a different quote unquote character in certain situations, right? So in most situations, I would ask, I would guide people to say, try and be and be perceived as the, the most confident version of you. Mm -hmm. So whatever that looks like for you, be that confident you, which means that you not only have to feel confident, but even if you don't feel confident, you have to show confidence. And then we go through all of the body language gestures to exhibit confidence. And also, there is an argument to be made for sometimes playing the bumbling idiot 
and and being that quote unquote character to be able to extract information. Mm-hmm. H- however, you can only play that card once with one person, right? You can play play it once with multiple people, but if you have an ongoing relationship with that person, you can only really show up that way once. Yeah. Until because if you do it again and again and again, eventually the person is going to be like, "Hey, what, what's going on?" Right? right. Like, why is which is why Columbo was so successful, right? Like it was <laughs> all different people, and he got to play it once with each person. Yes. So, yes, there is a role for playing a different character as long as it's well practiced, as long as it's with intention, as long as you've you've you're ready for whatever the response is, either negative or positive. Mm-hmm. And I think when people hear that, they're saying, oh, good, Mark, it sounds like you're removing a lot of creativity or style from my negotiation, to which my response is, you're not allowed to have a style. This, this whole idea of that's not my style is nonsense. Like, learn the fundamentals first, and then you can start adding your own twist yeah. to it and i think that a lot of people really struggle with that because everyone inherent because we buy and sell things all the time everyone inherently believes that they are great negotiators most people are not because yeah. they're controlled mostly by their emotions and i'm sure even in your profession right with with so much access to information everyone believes they're the best health professional there is, <laughs> right? And so they they come to you and they say, I have this. And you're like, that's a bold diagnosis based on <laughs> zero information, right? And the same is true for negotiation where, you know, I well, I'll do it this way. And you're like, I wouldn't recommend that. That's a really <laughs> bad idea. Um, so... Yeah, as long yeah. as it's well practiced and with the right intention, and you know the responses that you right. think, or at least you've got a high degree of your the probability of you getting that, you know that you're going to get that. The probability is high. Yeah. Then, then at least you're ready to be able to do that. But don't play the character unless you've you've done it well before. I know you're going into a dangerous landmine there. For sure, it's, it's really... a landmine laden area, yeah. right? I mean, especially. The reason I say well practiced is because it has to come off as genuine and sincere. Yeah. And if it doesn't come off as genuine and sincere, people are going to, the bullshit meters on people are really good, right? So people are going to see through that almost immediately. And they're going to say, even if they don't call you out on it, they're going to go in their head, something's going to go off and they're going to go, something's wrong here. I don't really know what it is, but there is something wrong here. Yeah. Different. I, there was a there was a question that came up when we, I was talking to a friend that we were going to be speaking, and he had had an experience that he wanted me to ask you if it was a good move he did, or 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 if it just luckily worked out that way. So basically, what happened is he's a nice guy. Um, I don't know, just kind of a normal, normal, normal nice person who's not very aggressive. And he was he was building a, a he, he was building an office, and he got fed up so much with the contractor after going back and forth so much that he finally, in a, in a little meeting, lost his temper, banged on the desk, ran out of the room, and didn't mean to do that, just kind of exploded. But what he found was when he came back and they all sat down again, the, the, the contractor and his team were much more pliable than they were before. They, they, were, they, were, they weren't trying to walk over him as much. And, um, you know, it sort of begged the question, is there a role for controlled outbursts of emotion. I mean, authentically or not, right? For him, it was very authentic. Uh, but, you know, you know, I, I think he felt bad at it in the moment, but when he looked back on it, he thought, oh, there was some use in that. Is, is there a role for that? Yeah, as long as it's intentional. I, I would say if it's uncontrolled and it, it happens because you have lost control of your emotions yeah, uh, and you get angry and, and you haven't managed that, the results could equally have been negative in his yeah. situation, right? The the contractor may have said, hey, this is not okay, right? Like, we don't talk to you that way. We don't accept that you talk to us that way. Maybe we should not work together. So there, 
that it went well is most likely a result of really great luck. Mm -hmm. um, however, like same as the sort of bumbling idiot example that I gave, if you have practiced that controlled outburst and that anger in certain situations really, really well, and you've role played it over and over again, and you can come off it immediately if you start to see movement from the other side or you know how to handle a negative response when that negative response comes up sure absolutely but what we're talking about here are like advanced tactics that i generally don't advise anyone do it's it's like um good cop bad cop right like good cop bad cop is probably the most common negotiation tactic that many people know about and it's it's a gambit, right? The the idea behind it is to get someone to talk to the more reasonable good cop, and there's supposed to be opposite example of bad cop, so that person is almost repelled by that bad cop, so that they talk to the good cop. But that only works. If it's well, like if you come in and you're only slightly more grumpy than the good cop, there is no, there is no dramatic example for you to exit away from. And so I, yeah, I just generally try and steer people away from gambits. There are a lot of them, right? You could use decoys, you could use red herrings, you could use good cop, bad cop. You, there's, there's so many that are available to you, but it's, hard to know what to use in specific situations if you haven't practiced them well. Yeah. It's a, it's like the example that we were talking about of Khrushchev uh, banging the, 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 Oh, the shoe on the, the, shoe shoe on the table sure. and, and, yeah, their address. And, uh, and some people said that that was such an emotional outburst. And some people said, well, did you notice that he was actually wearing two shoes and he actually intentionally brought it up and that was practiced. And so yeah. to your point of, of very well prepared and intentional, yeah. uh, the, Speaking to that, so of course, the more the more one can understand the matrix, so to speak, of the psychology of negotiation, and uh, the better, right? But right. are there certain heuristics that you would recommend people would know? So, for instance, we were talking about loss aversion, and uh, and yeah. Grant, uh, while an undergrad at Princeton University, uh, actually took um, took a class with then and then Daniel Kahneman, and. There was yeah no he, you know the idea about I think you were alluding to it before that the you know the way you frame it the way you frame a, a decision has a huge bearing on the outcome that that people yeah. don't make these very rational decisions and specifically people are so much more afraid of loss than they like they they would they would much rather not lose something than they would prefer to gain yeah. something you know they'll do they'll do a lot to avoid losing twenty dollars but not so much to go earn twenty dollars. Is there, a, I guess the, the question is like, are those kinds of things, do those come into play in, the, in negotiations? Yeah, I think the, the idea of heuristics, um, a lot of people really struggle with because it, it feels like such a high level topic. It almost feels like esoteric when you talk about it. Um, but all heuristics are is just shortcuts that the brain makes, right? To try and make faster decisions. So when we think of it that way, for sure, like how we talk about things and how we structure things can be, for lack of a better word, manipulated to drive different decisions, right? So um, the uh, like the loss aversion thing that you were talking about. So uh, I would rather avoid losing something than gaining something. So like the easiest example is like, if I know that you're if I know that you're driven by money, I could say, hey, if you do this thing, you'll make an extra $100,000. Or I could say, hey, if you don't do this thing, you're going to miss out on $100,000. Hmm. Yes. The data shows that people are more likely to pick option two than option one. So how you use heuristics in your in your everyday life can be super powerful especially in negotiations like the like the most common one in negotiation uh, aside from loss aversion is anchoring so uh, anchoring to for those for the listeners is this psychological predisposition that we have to react to the first piece of information that gets proposed to us 
And it, it for most people, especially the, like the most research around this is around pricing. So if I propose a price to you, because of anchoring, you react to that price, and now you've been anchored in the position of that price. And when you react, it's almost like you forget everything else that you've planned for, and now you're you're statistically more likely to get closer to the number that I've proposed than maybe anything that you had planned beforehand. And that's true for almost everything in negotiation. So if I can anchor you in a position, I want you to react to that position so that you come closer to my offer, which is why legal teams are so hell-bent on using their paper, right? So their terms and conditions. If I'm going to sign a contract, use my contract because I'm anchoring you in my terms and conditions. Um, and so for a lot of people, they, when they hear that, the immediate pushback that I get on the anchoring heuristic is like people saying, well, hang on, does that mean I should always make the first offer? Kind of. It de this is going to sound like a really crappy consultant answer, but it depends. <laughs> It depends on whether or not you have the information to support and the data to support a strong first offer, right? Like if I know what the market is providing and I know where market prices are, I know exactly what's going on, then I probably should make the first offer, whether I'm buying or selling. But if I don't know, and if I don't have good market intelligence, I should probably wait for that person's offer and hear that offer so that I can determine, okay, is this something that fits within the range of acceptable outcomes that I have? So it, it does depend on the situation that you're going into. Um, the, the interesting one that I, I was reading about the other day is um, like the availability heuristic. Like we recall the thing that is most available to us. So you may say, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to go catch this flight because everyone on airlines are dying. But you may just be recalling information on news of like a bunch of recent accidents that have happened. But the st statistics show that nothing has changed fundamentally. Right. Uh, but because of that, you're pulling that information, which is interesting because now if I can use the availability heuristic, I can seed ideas in your mind about what is the most common thing to do or the best thing to do or this is what everybody is doing and if i can see that idea in your mind over and over and over again by sending you things that support that either by third-party sources or by um, news clippings or headlines or whatever it might be your default response now is going to be based on that availability heuristic and you're going to respond in the way that I've basically conditioned you to respond in. And I, I, uh, I imagine that to make scary. that the most effective, you have to insert those things somewhat surreptitiously. I mean, it has to be a little bit... For sure. You, know, you can't be like, well, this is what everyone... This is, this, is, this is what everyone does and so this is what I'd like you to do. It has to be more, more subtle and gradual. For sure. Absolutely. And so when when people when people hear this, they're like, "Oh, like this could be used for evil." Uh, yeah. yeah, and it is all of these things, right? All of yeah, these, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like watch the news, right? Yeah. Like that's right. fundamentally what it's about, right? I, and it doesn't matter which news you watch, by the way. Like it's it's all structured a certain way to be able to get your attention to keep feeding you that information. Yeah. So it's it like, is well, interesting to me to see how like heuristics are. And here's here's probably the, like a really easy one for people to wrap their head around, right? Like, you, it, because it's a shortcut, and let's just say you were walking down a dark alley and you see a shadow move in a dark alley in the middle of the night. You're not going to stop in that moment to go through, I wonder what the probability is that this is danger 
or whether I should react a certain way. It was probably just a flag in the wind. Maybe it's just, you're not going to go through the logical process of trying to eliminate what's there. You're just going to react in that situation. That's essentially what yeah. we're talking about. Well, I'm trying and, to well, shortcut your brain. And yeah. by the way, to that point, there, there was a study where they, they did just that, but before that, someone either watched a rom-com movie uh, or they watched a horror movie, right? And yeah. the predictable outcome is exactly what happened, which is they were much less startled after the rom-com than after a horror movie, right? Because, yeah. you know, right. I mean, it's, it's, but well, either, either way, I think, I think there's a known negativity bias, which is we are much more likely, which is why the news are usually more right. scare sure. tactics and so on and so forth. Sure. We're more likely to be... Oh, it's survival, right? That, that's yeah. what our survival depends on. We're, People react to fear. Yes. Yeah. And we're more likely to survive if we were to respond and run away and it'd be nothing rather than be wrong about it. Yeah, it's an evolutionary yeah. response, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's just the way that people are, have been when designed. When cavemen wash rom-coms. <laughs> that's they, right. They knew they could relax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, like, the, the, it's funny that we're talking about this because I, I was giving guidance to someone the other day on they always had their hands underneath the table in in-person negotiations, and I said, keep your hands on top of the table. And they said, why? I said, because... When you have your hands underneath the table, it appears as though you've got something to hide. You're hiding, you're physically hiding something underneath the table, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, yeah, sorry, <laughs> and they said, well, I mean, obviously I don't have, I'm not physically <laughs> hiding something underneath the table. I said, yes, and the person sitting across the table from you also doesn't think that you're physically hiding something underneath the table, but because of that evolutionary response that you and I were talking about of like, you know, for thousands of years, my brain has been designed to protect me and get me to react instantly in moments of stress. Anything that increases the perceived stress level of that person or increases the stress level in general of that person is going to cause them to, you know, be a certain way. We're not, they're not going to be as open with us. So we want them to feel a certain way about us. So let's just not create situations where they think differently. Yeah. The, those subconscious processes also extend to some of the, some of the things that were identified about the cell phones, presence right. of the cell phone, right? If you have a cell phone face down on the table, it takes away from the communication and from the connection between the people because mm. oh, yeah. it takes away some of that intimacy, whether the, the moment is intimate or not. Uh, regardless of that, it takes something away. It's that that other presence, the possibility of another presence that's intervening into this conversation. For sure. Yeah. Well, so one of the things that we definitely want to to ask you about is decision fatigue. Yeah, that was yeah. a big one that we were open to. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this big field of research on the idea that we have a certain amount of of decision energy. We have we we have a certain amount of ability to, to, to uh, impose our willpower to make decisions. That's the book, um, it's called Willpower by uh, Roy wow. Baumeister that, that famously led to Obama saying, okay, I'm just gonna wear tan and gray suits and I'm not Great gonna idea. think about, right. So, and th there's, there's a study in fact, um, where they looked at car, back to cars, <laughs> they, they looked at uh, car uh, sales and you know, at the end of a car sale, you go through, do you want this, do you want that? and when they front loaded questions that didn't really matter, like to the sale price, like what color, this, rugs here, whatever. And then you get to the, to the middle or to the end and they ask you, and for the engine, you know, do you want the standard model or do you want, by then you're so, you've gone through too many decisions and people for can't sure. process them much. And so they default to the automatic and, and car dealers actually end up making $3,000 on average more as opposed to if they ask that first oh, and you have more energy to put into, well, I don't know, do I need the automatic or what are the other options? And then you can put all that energy there. Right. And I was, we, we, we were talking about that and, and wondering if, you know, does that factor, I mean, you know, does, does that factor into the way that you enter negotiation? We were talking about the dinner. You know, there was an idea for the dinner the, in, in the book that people go out to dinner first yeah. and then they meet up. And there was the idea that if you were being very Machiavellian, one thing you might do is, you know, where you're going to go to dinner, you know already what you're going to order, you know what's going to happen. For the sure. other person has to make all of these decisions. I don't even think that's Machiavellian. I just think that's strategic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that, is, is that, does that, does that, does that, does that loom large in these kinds of things? Sorry. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. That, and, and, and is there a, a 
flip side to that, on the receiving end of that, knowing that, should you just say, that's okay, you make the decision, <laughs> right? You just kind of take that away so you know that you don't want to get fatigued if someone asks you, what, well, where would you like to go? And you just say, I leave it all to you, knowing full well that what you're doing is preserving that willpower and, and avoiding decision fatigue. For sure. Decision fatigue is a thing. Uh, it absolutely exists. Um, being able to let go of that power, I think, is a super powerful way to do it. I think the easiest, this is essentially why everything about what we teach is process-based, so that it removes your need to be able to decide on certain things. Because if you're clear about what you want, you know what the ranges are, you know what you can and cannot do, then decision fatigue is lessened. It, it's still there, but it's lessened in mm -hmm. the situation that you're in. So you can actually expend energy doing and making decisions about things that are actually important. Um, yeah, for sure. There's, there's such, in negotiation, there is decision fatigue, but there's also such a thing as deal fatigue, just in general, where the negotiation has just gone on so long that, you know, the, the thought that a lot of negotiators, professional negotiators, um, whether they're doing real estate or sales or whatever it is that they do, if the deals lasted like three, four, nine, 13 months, what, however long it's taken, that, thought, that feeling that you get when you wake up in the morning, you go, God, this is the last thing I want to do today. Like that feeling, that is deal fatigue. When that happens, you are significantly more likely to concede at that point. And if I can, and concede on big things, and if I can notice that deal fatigue in you, I can utilize that to my advantage. So let's just say I notice that for you, this is taking a long time. You're really tired of going through this process. You really, you just want to get it done. And I, and I, I'm, I've had good rapport with you throughout. I might say, look, you've invested a lot of time into this. I've invested a lot of time into this. I know that this has taken way longer than it should have. Why don't you and I just agree that on this thing and then we could just wrap it up. <laughs> and now you're like, oh, thank God. Right? Like <laughs> the, the first thought that pops into your head is, praise <laughs> God, I have an opportunity to close this thing. But what I may have asked for may be a massive concession for you to make yeah. but because i've presented it as a way to end your, yeah. your terror right? right like this worst part of your life that this has become now i become the savior in that situation i've given you the out and i've presented you an opportunity for you to be able to do that meanwhile i've taken advantage of your deal fatigue in that situation so it, it can be along with decision fatigue it can be super powerful and if you're not aware of it like most people are not aware of that deal fatigue or decision fatigue is even a thing so if you're not aware that that's even a thing when you feel that feeling of like ah oh, this is the last thing that i want to do that's all you feel you don't even know what it is and so when someone gives you the opportunity it's a high five moment for you you're like yes Let's get out of here, right? <laughs> Let's go for steak. We're done. <laughs> if if you're if if you are someone who is aware of that, do you have any tools to replenish it, or do you just need to disconnect from it until you? Yeah, awareness that is the biggest tool. So, um, knowing that you are feeling that way is a big deal, um, and then taking time just to be able to like recenter yourself. Go for a walk. Go for a jog. Get a workout in. Yeah. Do, do something else that's not related to that is is really, really important. Um, something that I was hoping to get to ask, uh, and I, I, I we were talking about it, and I acknowledge that it's a bit out of movies, but I still, sure. it's still I, I don't know where you know fiction ends and, and reality begins. Um, things like manipulating the temperature of the room like mm. the, the idea of manipulating the physical space in a negotiation yes. the idea yeah. of having light 
behind you. Um, wobble the chair. Your chair. <laughs> like I keep on lowering Zenobi's chair just as a power move. <laughs> he keeps on raising it. Um, you know, giving the other one person a broken chair. Like those kinds of are yeah. those things just for movies or do they have a role in negotiation? Uh, that was very popular in like the 80s and the early 90s. Um, and I can re still remember like early on in my career where I sat in on one particular negotiation. And I, I think I might have been like a few years out of college where someone had deliberately lowered my chair and it couldn't be increased in size. <laughs> and the amazing. room was freezing. And I had to like wear a jacket just to like survive in the room. Um, I there they maybe want they maybe get someone to want that thing to end faster but in in long term relationships and negotiations all it does is force that person to be uncomfortable and then they're not sharing information with you so they're just they, they just want to get it done more than anything else and i think also it's different probably today in that a lot of people will just say, hey, it's really cold in here, right? Like, <laughs> let's go what somewhere you doing? else. Sorry, like, you guys... Yeah, like, my chair doesn't work. Does <laughs> your chair work? Whereas before, right, there were these power movers and it right, may have, been, you may have felt like you have less leverage. But I think that the likelihood of that happening now in today's day and age is, is very, very low. Very low. Something that um, I, I remember, I, I used to watch the show called Justified on, on FX. Yeah. And the, the main character was played by Timothy Oliphant, and he was being interviewed. He, he plays a sheriff that, that's, or a, 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 some kind of law enforcement, I forget, a federal sure. agent. Anyway, he said when he's being interviewed, he, he said that he was always fascinated by characters who are comfortable making other people uncomfortable and being able mm -hmm. to sit in that, in, in that space. Sure. And it really resonated because I do think that that's a skill set. I think a yeah. lot of doctors, I don't, I don't think we have that particularly because right. right. we're, we're so much wanting everyone to feel better and please and stuff. But, but it seems like that that might be a really powerful tool. Um, is that something that 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 yeah that you run into? Abs absolutely. I think there. I I wouldn't say it's the intention of making someone feel uncomfortable so much as it you being comfortable with discomfort. Right. So you can ask a difficult question or a potentially offensive question and be okay with the discomfort or the awkwardness of that question and sit in that silence. And we know that people are going to be uncomfortable with it. So watching them react to that situation, the, the way that I like to describe this is if you ask me for something, and I, I think I gave this example a little bit earlier. My first response isn't going to be, oh, maybe I can do that. My first response is going to be, I'm not sure I can do that. Yeah, right. Yeah, right, right. And, that just and then just, and then just <laughs> waiting, right? And then waiting right. for your response. And in that silence, nine times out of 10, that's not an official metric, but yeah. most of the time, the person who you're negotiating with is going to go, Right. Uh, well, let's talk about it, right? Like, let's have a converse. Because silence is super uncomfortable for us. And w at least in the West, it is. Like, we, we just sh really struggle with silence. Um, and so I think if you can create those situations where you can ask challenging questions or difficult questions or, or potentially awkward questions that you know may open up a whole new area of value for you and you're okay with sitting in that discomfort and and being awkward about it like i i try and i guide people and say like channel your inner dwight Schrute, right like if you've <laughs> ever watched the office like yeah, just yeah. just be just be dwight right like ask the awkward question and then just sit there like it's normal right and wait for the response because that's usually where a lot of value is created. If you can just be comfortable with a difficult question yeah. or an awkward question, you can open up a whole area of possibility you didn't have before. Yeah. And you mentioned the the, the value of pauses. And uh, so mm -hmm. uh, Adam Alter um, in his book, um, quoting a study that three to 12 second pauses uh, created better achieved negotiations. And is that possibly also why that silence that most people are awkward with if you if you're the one creating that 
Yeah. Maybe, may, maybe the driving force behind it. For sure. I mean, we I delivered a negotiation training session this morning to a, a, a group of oil company executives, and I and these are people who are lawyers, accountants, professionals who have been in business for thirty plus years, and sat around boardroom tables that generate billions upon billions of dollars, and forced them to ask each other awkward, difficult questions and sit in silence for just one minute, and no one could do it. <laughs> and you would think like, oh, this is a multi-billion dollar organization. Surely these steel-minded professionals should be, a... right. no one could do it. And and everyone cracked, everyone laughed, everyone giggled, everyone smiled. Some people were like, oh, this is terrible, right? And it was it, this really terrible situation of realization where they go, oh, right. why do I, why do I feel the need to be able to justify my request or or fill that void of silence when instead I could just sit there and wait. Yeah. For some reason, I find that very endearing that you have these oil executives that, you know, are still have this human side that they just Oh, can't, they are. Yeah. They're, they're human beings. They're people, yeah. They have problems just like everyone else. Of course. And they, they have emotional insecurities just like everyone else. And they have issues around relationships just like everyone else. And and so I think we, just because of their titles, we we place this character that we think yeah. that they are on them. But they're just like you and me. Yeah. There was a lawyer that you had on your podcast that was saying a similar thing about when she would just be silent, just 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 let there be a silence that the yeah. opposing uh, side would start blurting out information that they didn't necessarily mean to blurt out, just For just sure. to fill that silence. It's a really powerful tool silence is powerful silence is yeah. powerful yeah we, we have to go. we have to you, let you, you go more i mean we could i gosh i could i could we have pages we've got pages and pages <laughs> <laughs> you, thank you so much you've been really generous thank with you your so time. much for having me this was just fantastic i really but, appreciate it guys it was a great pleasure to be with you friends thank you for your attention we hope you've enjoyed the conversation if you find value please remember to hit the like button help us with our youtube algorithm Consider subscribing to the channel and turn on the notifications so you can stay up to date with everything going on with the channel. And please leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought about the show and also what you'd like to hear about in the future. 